Hi guys. When we last left off in this vlog series, we were finishing up a big miter saw workstation and a new hand tool wall. And here's the last thing I said to you. Next time we'll make some doors and drawers, then I'll give you the full tour of the unit once everything is in place. Well, here we are two months later and I still have not made those doors and drawers yet because stuff happens. A lot of stuff has happened over the last two months in fact. We've made 17 new videos in that time, including a comprehensive uh, tutorial on dovetailing and a five video series on the table saw that's just packed with stuff. You should check them out. We've also made a cool tools video and 10 different quick tip videos. So lots of videos have been coming out. Plus I've done two meet and greets appearances at Chicago area Rockler stores. And I went to the Detroit woodworking show and I'm getting ready to head out to Atlanta in a couple weeks to hang out with fans and other YouTubers on March 15th through 17th. So if you're in the Atlanta area, come say hello. So the bottom line is I've been busier than a cat trying to cover turds on a marble floor. And that doesn't even count all the projects that have been going on behind the scenes here. One of which I'm going to talk to you about today, but in the meantime, don't despair. We'll put the finishing touches on the hand tool wall shortly and then do that tour of all of its super awesome features and hidden compartments and all that cool stuff. Now what's today's big project you ask? Well, I'm putting new router tables in the side wing of my table saw, which is something a lot of people have been anxiously awaiting. Yes, I said router tables, plural. I'll explain that later. But the biggest question is what the heck's wrong with the router table that I already had in the saw? Well, the answer is simple. It is sagging faster than your grandma's polyurethane on a vertical surface. <laughs> You thought that joke was going in a different direction, didn't you? Shame on you. This is a family show. My sag problem is due to the sheer weight of the routers and their lifts. You see, the fancy side table that came with my saw may look nice and thick, but it's nothing more than shiny lipstick on an MDF pig. There was a pine framework on the underside, which I may have compromised a bit when I hacked out one of the router openings, but my mistakes are neither here nor there. Saw stop really never made that to support routing equipment. My table is no longer flat and something just had to be done with it. So as a temporary solution, several months ago, I abandoned the whole thing and I got a standalone router table from Rockler, which I've talked about in some videos. I really grew to love that setup so much so that I decided to adapt it to my table saw so I could have the setup I liked, but I could save that precious floor space. But how do I do it? If I put it this way, I'll need filler strips and that's going to be a pain and kind of look funny, I think. In the other direction, it's a bit too wide to fit between the rails. Even on my industrial size saw stop, which is four inches wider between the rails than most other cabinet saws. So I guess I'm going to have to trim it. Now this is a phenolic top which is very stable. It's a rock hard synthetic resin and there's also aluminum T-Track embedded inside. So how do you cut it? Well, you can cut it with a regular table saw and carbide blades, unless you have a saw stop because that aluminum will trigger the safety system and cost me about 200 bucks in a new blade and break. Fortunately, there is a way to disable the safety system on a saw stop just takes a series of steps that are designed to make it inconvenient to disable the safety system on a saw stop. Having done it, I proceeded with my cut, holding my breath as the blade got close to the aluminum, but it was fine. It worked like a charm. However, when I turned the saw off, the safety system was automatically reactivated. So some dope like me doesn't forget and leave a safety system off long term and end up trimming his fingernails an inch too short. Of course, that same dope now has to remember to go through that deactivation process for every cut. When you turn the saw off, it reactivates every time you turn it back on. You have to go through that process. I had several cuts to make, so that key got worked pretty steadily. Speaking of keys, there used to be a chicken coop behind the shop with two doors on it. Why two doors? Because if it had four doors, it'd be a chicken sedan. Speaking of two, did I mention I was fitting two of these router tables in the side of my saw? Why? Because I have the room and I have the routers and it impresses visitors to my shop, but I need a way to support them. The router tables, not the visitors. And I want to be absolutely sure they won't sag over time. So I bought some angle iron, which I planned to attach to the underside of my rails. That's where saw stop kicked me in the old giblets again. The motor access door on this saw, opens on the right side. 
but the angle part of my angle iron prevents that door from opening. And if that door can't open, where am I going to stuff the shop cat at night? The solution was to notch the ends and turn the angle in the upright position. Fortunately, this didn't protrude above the surface of the saw, and it left just enough room for the door to squeak below it, minus a little bit of paint. Before I took the big square tube off my fence rail, and I'm pretty sure that is the technical name for it, the big square tube, I scribed a line along it so I knew how much room I had for the carriage bolt heads to seat without interfering with the big square tube once it was reinstalled, because I am just dumb enough to put those holes anywhere and then the tube won't go back on and it'll just mess everything up. Then I used a center punch to give my bit a good starting point, and since I was boring through some pretty thick steel, I used some light machine oil to keep the bit lubricated. The key is to just take your time or you'll heat up the bit and dull it. Don't ask me how I learned that lesson. I also made sure the holes I bored were large enough for the shoulder of the carriage bolt to fit inside so the head would be flush once it was installed. Don't ask me how I learned that lesson either. Another problem I encountered was the front rail on my saw was about 3 eighths of an inch higher than the back rail, so I had to make some plywood shims to get them as close as possible. To attach the angle iron supports, I used some lock washers because the last thing I want is for one of these things to vibrate loose and everything I worked hard to shim up gets uneven again. I carefully spaced the supports so they were parallel to each other. I'm not sure that was all that important, but I did it anyway. What was important was ensuring that none of them would block the vital openings in the router tables above it. That really became a factor when I installed the last support. The front rail of my saw is not only higher than the back, it's also longer. I hadn't counted on that. And it meant that the last iron support would come very close to being beneath the opening on the router table above it. That would have messed everything up. So I attached it as close to the end of the rear rail as possible. Every millimeter counted. <laughs> See how I threw in that metric reference for our international viewers? You're welcome. I had just enough room to reinstall the fence tube without the carriage bolts heads getting in the way, which was a relief, worthy of a cold one, let me tell you. But I had a lot of shimming to do. The phenolic top is only about three quarters of an inch thick. That means I had to make up the difference of about two and five sixteenths to get my tops flush with the top of the saw. And that difference was slightly more at the front of the saw than it was at the back, even with that little shim that I had stuck in there. So instead of making spacers that would fit exactly, I made them undersized so I could then use shims to make up the difference later. You'll see what I mean shortly. My spacers were made from plywood. I thought that was a better idea because solid wood might move too much, and once I get everything flush on the top of my saw, I want it to stay that way. <laughs> flush. I have a strict one poo joke rule per video, so I'm just gonna leave that one alone. By the way, these silicone bench mats are a lifesaver with messy glue ups like this. They keep my bench clean and the glue just peels right off. I'll put a link to them in the notes below this video as well. I didn't take any video of when I ground the notches into the rails of my $5,000 cabinet saw because it looked pretty reckless. Plus, I was worried about another disaster, like when I ground the opening in the top of Mustache Mike's car. I guess sunroofs aren't meant to go in ragtop convertibles. But in this case, I was pretty confident it was a necessary modification because I wanted to be able to utilize the handy miter and T-tracks that are built into the router tables. Next, I attached the wooden spacers to the iron supports, remembering to cut notches in the two that pass under the fence slots in my router tables. Speaking of router tables, here's another terrible idea I had. I planned to attach a flat bar to the seam beneath the two table tops so I could fuse them into one and they'd be nice and flush. First of all, it's a pain in the tuchus to drive screws in phenolic. It will not compress like wood. So your pilot holes have to be almost as large as the screw threads, and you have to drive them in carefully or you're gonna twist the heads off. Or you could tap them and put in bolts. But after all that work, I realized that the two tops must have come from different factory batches because while they were close in thickness, they weren't exactly, and I ended up with a ridge on the top. So I had to tear that all apart, wasted my time, and I was going to have to shim them separately. Before I shim, though, I had to bore holes from the top side and use a countersink to make sure the heads of the mounting screws would set below the surface. I hate that star shape that you get from crappy countersinks like this. I'm going to have to order some good ones from Fish. 
one set of mounting holes had to go through the aluminum tracks and there was no room for a countersink there. So I just used a larger drill bit to counter bore the hole. Worked good. I marked where the wood supports touched the underside of the router tables and then flipped them upside down so I could see how to position my dust enclosure. I was worried it wasn't going to fit because remember that last support was really close to the router opening, but I managed to just squeeze it in. These enclosures are great for dust collection beneath the table. I'll link to them in the notes below the video too. I also attached the table saw support legs to the bottom of the end router table. These are important because believe it or not, the weight of two routers and their lifts will actually throw off the balance of a 700 pound saw when they're out on a long side table like this. Who knew? Once everything was in place, it was time for the final shimming. That's where Mustache Mike came in handy because I'm getting too old to be crawling around on the floor. Here's a tip. If you're using a stack of washers to shim, add a wrap of tape. It makes them easier to keep together and the layers of tape can help you fine tune the stack. Just be sure you account for the drawdown effect when you screw everything in place. Shimming is a labor of love and I am quite sure the stash loved every minute of it. Time to install the lifts and answer the question that's on a lot of your minds. Why two router tables? Well, it's not because I do production work. I don't. It's because I have two favorite router setups. My everyday setup is the Rockland one that I've just gotten used to using. It's fast and easy and convenient. So I put that on the end table where I'll use it the most. But I also have a computerized router fence and lift that I've been using for years and I don't want to get rid of it because it's really cool. So the end table is for the Rockler one, that's my daily user. And then when I want to use the fancy digital apps on the ready to route system, I can attach that fence to the other router table and go nuts. For the average shop though, one lift is going to be plenty. And if you plan on adding a router table to your table saw, the Rockler Fidelic top is an excellent choice because it's nice and stiff and stable. But keep this in mind, my saw is an industrial model. It's probably wider between the rails than yours. If you turn your sideways and mount it like I did, you may have to trim more off to make it fit. The distance between the two slots that are used to attach the fence to the router table is 28 inches. So if the space between your rails is less than about 30 inches, you may end up trimming off at least one of those slots, which then you'll have to recut with the router. So keep that in mind. Of course, you can make your own router top, but plywood isn't as stiff as phenolic. So one layer is not going to be enough. Make it extra thick and use lots of support like I did, or you'll have sagging down the road. Well, that wraps up this project, but we have lots more going on. We still have to finish this hand tool wall. We've already begun a lathe cabinet and I'm working on plans for a carving station. Then we're installing new shop lighting. And I think this may be the year I finally install that air conditioner. And by that, I mean, this may be the year Mustache Mike installs that air conditioner. So you and I can sit back and have ourselves a gold one because you've earned it, my friend. Rockler Woodworking and Hardware is simply a great company. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to support the online woodworking community and to help preserve this craft we love for future generations. I hope you return the favor by visiting their website using the link below this video. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.